Welcome to the Weekly Gaming Blast. I'm your host, Akibana Zero. And I'm Rue the Gamer. Hello. And we're going to be delivering to you the new, the gaming news of this past week. How have you been, Ruben? I have been, I have been well. Very, very well. How are you? Not bad. Not bad. It's been really, really windy here in Brighton. What's it like up there in Kent? Uh, it's been raining, but other than that, the weather's been fine, which is unusual for Kent, actually. Usually the weather's worse here. Oh, how so? Uh, it's just usually just terrible weather. <laughs> um, then again, that might just be because I don't really want to be in this town. <laughs> so it could, it could be that. Uh, it could be me projecting, let's be honest. Yeah, you're always mentioning something about Kent being a little bit boring, yeah? Well, I don't know. I mean, I went, um, I went across to um, the nearest kind of big town today, and um, I found out the Smiths Toy Store, as in like that, you know, the brand Smiths, mm -hmm. that the, the, the toy store. Um, their games are really cheap. I was looking in the game section in Smiths, and I was just like, how are these games so much better priced than anywhere else? Like brand new I mean, games. Yes, brand new game. Splatoon, uh, Splatoon 2 in there was £45 as opposed to 40, uh, 50 which it is everywhere else. Oh. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I just saw some of the game prices and I was like, this is insane. And um, Injustice 2 was £25. Well, shit. Yeah. You sure it wasn't a used picked, game I, section? Nope, it was brand new. Wow. The, news, the, the used game section is weirdly laid out. Uh -huh. I have to say that. The used game section in Smiths, they just put all games from all formats just all together. Uh, um, okay. So their used game section is a fucking mess. <laughs> but their their game prices are incredible. Like, absolutely incredible. Well, I wish... I, I don't know. Is there a Smiths in Brighton? <laughs> I don't, I don't no. think so. No, no, of course not. Nowhere near. Nowhere near, huh? That, well, that's, that sucks. Want to yeah, get some really cheap does. games myself. <laughs> 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 well, Brighton is Brighton, right? So, yeah, it's good for th some things, not great for others. Right. So what have you been playing this week? I've mostly been playing the same stuff, if I'm perfectly honest. Um, Practicing on Blaze Blue. Um, obviously, I've streamed Salt and Sanctuary this week, which I really enjoyed. And I streamed Doom last night as well. Um, I mean, I have been playing... Um, because what I end up doing is when I'm not doing streams, I end up playing fluff games. I.e. games that don't really have a purpose, don't really have a point. Uh, per se but i just throw away fun so i've been playing a game called we are doomed on vita which is a two stick shooter um it is impossible to follow what's going on because everything because the thing is it's not as if it's like normal two stick shooters where the action itself is colorful but the rest of it is plain this everything is colorful so the explosions will sometimes disguise the enemies because you can't see them because they're both brightly colored and it's really hard to follow what's going on, but the game is really quite fun and enjoyable, and it's it's good to throw away time on, hmm. at the very least. Sounds hectic and chaotic, and that yep. seems like it would make for an incredibly awesome stream. Yeah. Oh, well, uh, I might be able to stream, actually. I don't know whether it's a PS4, PS Vita kind of crossplay. I might look into that. We are doomed. Oh, I'll, I'll look into that. I did watch your Salt and Sanctuary videos, and I caught your stream <laughs> one day. That game looks like the kind of thing that would really, really piss me off a lot. So, yeah, might have to give that a go sometime. It's Souls just with a more finicky control pack scheme, is what it is. Okay. So you get dicked over by the controls a lot in that game. Awesome. Exactly what I mm. need to get dicked over by the, the controls. Uh, what have you been playing? Well, you know what I've been playing. You know what I've been playing. I've been playing Destiny 2, my friend. Yes. Oh, we'll get to that later, won't we? You've got a lot to say on it. We will. I've got plenty to say about it. Some bad, but for the most part, and if you're a Destiny player, I'm going to preface this by saying it is what Destiny 1 was supposed to be and more. Oh, that's a bold claim. It's a very bold claim on my part. It's not without some of its faults. It's not without some things that we would say, oh my God, why do they do it like this and not like that? But, and there is a little bit of controversy for it as well, but for the most part, I would say I'm extremely happy with it and I'm having a lot of fun. Good to hear. And so speaking of controversy, let's just drop right into our controversial section, shall we? Yep. And what do we have for today? Controversial stuff. Gaming journalists being good at games? 
are they supposed to be good at games? Are they not? That's the question that's been burning right now this week for a lot of people. That's caused a lot. Like I've seen so many good arguments on both sides of that on on both sides of that topic. Um, it's really hard to know where to fall on it. If I'm honest, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit honest. I think as a topic, it's a little bit stupid. I want to say because well, I can't believe it's come up. You're right. Exactly. I mean, it's like why are we why are we hating on this? It's like we we need to explain what's going on here for a moment. First of yes, all, so it was there was this guy playing a demo. This is not even a review, okay? This is not a review. This is nothing. There was a video that came out where a, a, a person who was allegedly a journalist was playing Cuphead, which uh, Dilips, by the way, should be watching right now, and he's uh, probably, uh, th you know, like he knows about Cuphead. He's really excited about that. But anyway, this guy was playing Cuphead. And he's really bad at it. He's so bad, he's having a lot of trouble with the little tutorial that tells him how to jump and all of that stuff. He keeps failing at doing the jump dash thing. And people have jumped all over this. They're like, is this the kind of gameplay level we could expect from professional reviewers? <laughs> it's it's weird. Right. It's a weird topic to, to you know, latch on to, right? Yeah, right. Okay. Let me make my thoughts on this incredibly clear. I am a games journalist, or if, let's be technical, I am a games journalist. I review games, I write editorials about games, I'm quite actively somewhat involved in the industry because of my connections in Nintendo UK, etc, 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 disclaimer, disclaimer. I do not claim, nor would I ever claim, to be great at all games because that's impossible that genuinely is impossible um but it just so happens that the main site i write for we all have our own specialisms therefore we get attributed to us generally generally the games that are most appropriate for what we're good at mm -hmm. because at that point you are the best almost like the uh the best um the best person to talk about said game because you understand what said game would be aiming to do so for instance you wouldn't put me reviewing a first person shooter i have no idea what a good or bad first person shooter is supposed to be i have no idea about the mechanics of the game i don't understand how the games work even so me reviewing that game would be biased because i would find it very i i would have the first barrier to entry being the fact that i'm not good at the game to begin with then I'd have to get past that and then review it, at which point that would be biased in that way. But obviously then you have the argument for the other side where if you have, say, me reviewing a JRPG, generally I'll be overwhelmingly positive about it because I love JRPGs. There's the argument either way. No gamer is good at every single type of game, so therefore we cannot expect every game journalist to be good at every type of game. I mean, the fact of the matter is that video was not a review. No. It was, if anything, it was a preview. And also, you have to factor in the fact that that particular writer doesn't write reviews generally. Yeah. They write they write industry editorials generally, commentaries on the industry, comments, commentaries on what the industry are doing, what de developers are doing. That's the sort of article he normally does. He doesn't normally do reviews. He's done a handful of reviews in the last couple of years, I believe. So he's not a reviewer anyway. So that's ludicrous. Plus, as an additional facet to this argument, which I actually heard, so I read someone writing about on Twitter, and I found it very interesting. Um, the people that have commented about this and have said that games journalists should be good at games are themselves, and I use this term very, very loosely because I find it slightly reductive, elite gamers. And for them to expect the industry in terms of the writing industry about games to cater to them is ludicrous because they make up a very small proportion of the overall reading public when it comes to games journalism. The majority of people that read it are going to either be casual gamers or are going to be, I don't know what you would, what you would call it, maybe essential gamers, those that game because they enjoy doing it, but aren't of any sort of, they don't consider themselves to be the best. Um, so these elite gamers are a very, very small proportion of the overall audience. So for them to expect journalism to be tailored to them 
is I don't want to use the word entitlement, but it does. But that's a quite appropriate term. <laughs> Probably the um, most appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's essentially all my thoughts just splurged out there on this whole issue. <laughs> <laughs> See, the the thing of the matter, the thing, uh, the point of the matter here is like, what well, first of all, what are we defining here as being good at, at at a game? I mean, yeah, sure, you you need to be able to eventually be able to finish a game before you can review it. Okay, so once mm -hmm. I complete a game, isn't that enough for me to just state my thoughts on how good a game is? And f second of all, what does being good at a game have? anything to do with an opinion of with a consumer level opinion because yes first of all this game is supposed to be purchased by the general public okay cuphead is not a fighting game cuphead is not uh is not starcraft it's not a rts it is a game that is meant for the wider general public and you could say that it, it is a little bit artsy because of its uh you know unique animation and its unique uh you know art style but the thing about it is that it's it's not a game that is meant for for somebody who's gonna go out and take mlg or something like that so what does being good at it have anything to do with a with a reviewer's perspective it doesn't it absolutely doesn't and um, I mean, there's one thing that you said in that entire flurry that I do have a minor disagreement in. You don't have to finish a game to be able to review it, in my opinion. Okay. You can get a decent enough impression of a game and also be able to review almost all of its facets way before the end of the game. Right, I feel kind of um, in the same sense I could give a bit of a review of Dark Souls, even though I haven't completed the game. I think I've already experienced the gamut of what the game is about and who it could appeal to and why. Yeah, the only things that you haven't experienced in Dark Souls, from what I've seen so far, I haven't seen the latest episode yet, um, is the only things you haven't experienced so far are the... the sort of performance-enhancing aspects that you acquire later. Uh -huh. So certain items that 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 make your character more versatile, but not versatile in terms of the combat won't change. The bosses that, or the way that the bosses are set up won't change. The exploration won't change. It's just there's certain facets that will alter in the game. Uh -huh. So you, ha you have more than got far enough into the game that you could review it. Right. I, I have a ba basic idea of it, and that is basically what can be expected from a reviewer. At the same yes. time, I know what sometimes people mean when they say that maybe a reviewer might might need to have a bit of an idea or some level of expertise with a particular type of game, like you mentioned. And this was always a heavily yes. debated uh, topic with the FG scene, fighting game scene, when it came to reviews that were done again on the consumer level. These, again, are not reviews for fighting game enthusiasts or pros or competitors. But... Uh, yes, we do need reviews that are for that level of play, but I guess you could say that specialized websites like Shoryuken.com are basically for that purpose. They make reviews yes. of their own for these games. There does exist websites where you can go for that level of play reviews, um, but don't go to places like Destructoid or Polygon or um, to, to use a kind of like Nintendo Life and sites like that, do not go to sites like that and expect that level of play in your review. Um, I mean, I was going to make another point, and I've entirely forgotten what it was to do with this exact issue. Um, and no, it's gone. It's gone. It's gone. I'll probably think of it again later. It's out the window. We will. We can. We can circle back to it. But yeah, overall, yeah, this is the burning topic right now in the in the gaming industry and the gaming uh, community at large. So. I don't know. Whatever your thoughts might be, sound off in the comment section below, please. Moving on, one other big piece of controversy doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the gaming community, but it has to do with the Malaysian government. They have blocked not just a game. They've blocked Steam entirely because of a game. And the game doesn't even look that good. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's what offended them to begin with i don't know no no we know what offended them it's the very very heavy um religious undertones in the game that offended them yeah let's be honest um which i can understand but the game looks like a sodding mobile title and even then not a very good one <laughs> um 
but um, to, to clear this up, this is the game Fight of Gods. Um, that is an early access game currently on Steam where all of the fighter is a fighting game where all of the fighters are religious figures. <laughs> um, so the introduction trailer had um, Jesus fighting against, was it Vishnu? Yeah, it was one like of it was it was one of the um, Hindu Hindu gods, mm. um, and it's hilarious what they've done with it i must have it looks awful the animations look terrible the character models look bad as well um but i can't help but find it hilarious some of the things they've done like for instance jesus attacks with fragments of the crucifix that he's still got <laughs> nailed to his hands when he punches he attacks with those crucifix sections um and there's just stupid, and also they put a that the, the developers have put a poll on Twitter asking what religious figures um, the fans want to see in the game. That's prompted some hilarious, hilarious responses. Um, but it just looks like, to be fair, conceptually, the game is a great idea, <laughs> if incredibly controversial, and it was obviously going to turn heads. But the fact that the Malaysian government were very unhappy with the game and Steam refused to remove it, has led to Steam being essentially blocked in Malaysia. <laughs> Which is brilliant. And it's it is, a parody. It's, it's one of the funniest pieces of controversial news I've heard in a long time. It's a parody. It's meant to yeah. be satire. It's meant to be funny. I understand. Okay, I understand that, you know, governments and, you know, religious people get, get offended by these things, but... I don't want to turn this into a freedom of speech kind of discussion over here because that we could be here all day. The thing, yeah. the point of the matter is though that they have taken like this very, very uh, band aid sort of approach to today. It's like we we need to stop this immediately. Block Steam, block the whole damn thing immediately. Like take a more you know proper approach to it. You know, I mean, it's not like. If you if you stop things from happening a week from now, that it's gonna make a difference on anything. You don't need to just block Steam right off the bat completely just because you want to take action right there and then. Well, to be fair, I must admit, I kind of respect Malaysia for this because how often do you see anyone standing up against Steam? That is fair. That is fair. And they've just come out and blocked one of the biggest gaming platforms in the world. <laughs> um, Your move, Gabe. Your yeah. move. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> Gabe, no. It's, it's down to you. The, the ball is definitely in your court now. Absolutely. Like, that's it. You, what, what, what's next, man? Where's Halo 3, Gabe? Where's Halo 3? Where's Halo Don't 3? Don't you mean Half-Life? Half-Life, Half -Life, sorry. Half-Life 3. I was going to say, Halo 3 came out years ago. Where's, <laughs> where's Half-Life 3, Gabe? <laughs> Half-Life 3, which, by the way, was another piece of controversial news that came out where somebody... Controversial. Nothing controversial. It's just that like one of the former writers came out and said, like, here's, here's how it's going to... Here's what it's supposed to end in my mind. So take do with it what you will. Ugh, just... Half-Life 3 is not coming. Never. Not now, anyway. Never. It may come in the future when Gabe Newell runs out of money, but seeing as he has Steam, as long as he's not solely hedging his bets on making money in Malaysia, he's fine. <laughs> I love it. Anyway, that's, uh, yeah. That's that's the big funny controversy that's going on right now. Anyway, I'm kind of used to the I I kind of un see how this whole concept of censorship works because I used to live in China and there was like, you know, there was a lot of weird censorship issues like that. Like for example, when uh Wrath of the Lich King, uh World of Warcraft's second expansion came out, which featured a lot of undead characters, a lot of ghouls, a lot of skeletons, China blocked that expansion from coming out and Chinese players didn't see that expansion for like a very long time later until Blizzard made it so that specifically all all images of skeletons and death were removed from the game. My God. 
Cen- censorship's a weird thing. I've always very, found it a little bit weird. Very, very weird. And whenever I talk to Chinese people about this topic and I ask them, is there some th- weird thing with depictions of skeletons and death in your country? And they're like, not really. No, because basically what had happened back then, there was some kind of infighting happening between two government bodies that were dealing with, you know, licensing and allowing content be- to be released and all that. And Blizzard was just caught in the crossfire with that. But at the same time, the excuse was hilarious because it's like, we don't want any death depictions in a video game where people die sometimes and then get resurrected. Censorships, funny, funny topic, always yeah. interesting. Well, it's not going to be the last time we hear of it. So, onward and forward to our short and sweet list. Let's start hearing about some good stuff and maybe some relatively okay stuff. So, this came a little bit out of left field. L.A. Noir being re-released on four I'm different platforms. Hmm? I'm very pleased. I never got a chance. I, I never played L.A. Noir the first time around, but I heard very good things. And it's coming to Switch, so I can play it whenever I want, exactly. wherever I want. Exactly. The first Rockstar game for Switch, by the way, pointing it out mm. here. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I'll, I think I'll buy that for Switch. Yeah, I think it would be nice. Is it November? November. November 14th, I want to say. Yeah. Hmm. That might be my game for November. Yeah. Because I, t- I, I, t- I tend to buy a game a month, and that uh, my game for this month comes out this week. Um... <laughs> So, yeah, so that will definitely probably be my game for November because I've always wanted to play it, so I might as well give it a shot. Awesome. Uh, and it's also coming out for PS4, Xbox One, and PC is the fourth yes, platform? Yes, PC. PC, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. And finally, for PC players, because PC has been around forever and still hasn't seen L.A. Noir. That's fine. That's fine. So remember when we reported about uh, No More Heroes, quote-unquote, 3? Well... We were kind of wrong, and it, we we everybody actually kind of misinterpreted this. And it's no more. It's not no more heroes three. It's Travis strikes back. No more heroes. Mm. It's but the thing is I, because let's be honest, Suda fifty one has screwed the pooch a little bit on this because Travis strikes again is set after the second game, but it's supposed to be like some kind of. Side story ish kind it, of thing. Yeah, it is. It is a side story. It is a spin off. But during that trailer, the character that attacks Travis is getting revenge for something that happened in No More Heroes Two. So he has it. So it is essentially the way you could describe this is this is essentially No More Heroes Two Point Five. Okay. Yeah. Would be the best way to describe it. By by the sounds of things, because that character that attacks Travis is definitely getting revenge. So, yeah, so this is set after the second one, but it's not the third one. So we'll go with 2.5 as the most accurate name. Might as well just call it 3 then, unless the game plays somewhat differently, I guess, from the original. Which I doubt it will. I hope it does. I really do. I love No More Heroes, but I would like to see something new done with Travis. Which is why I really wanted him to be in Smash, but he never was. He should have been in Smash, right? I thought he would have made a very interesting character for Smash. Maybe too many swords, though. Yeah, that swords are always a problem, I hear, in that game. I mean, some people I know who play it think that, you know, if there are too many sword characters, it gets a little bit weird. Like, balance is a little out of whack. But he could be an interesting sword character. Like, maybe his sword isn't always active because it's an energy weapon. I don't know. I'm thinking yeah. about. I'm making games in my head now. Uh, well, we can hope. Yep, we, we can, can definitely hope. hope. Just like we can hope uh, that Bayonetta three is actually real. If it is, I will lose my shit. <laughs> I love, love Bayonetta. I love the first game. I love the second game even more. And if uh, Kamiya is, if Kami- if this is more than just you know a throwaway comment. If this is an actual genuine hint about there being Bayonetta 3, I am sold already. So Hideki Kamiya made a comment on Twitter where he said, wait for Bayonetta 3. I don't remember what he was responding to, but he said, wait for Bayonetta 3. And people now are jumping on this that this is confirmation that it's happening, which would be amazing if it is. I haven't played Bayonetta. But I would love to see a Bayonetta collection on Switch. I would buy it instantly because I, I like this style of game. It kind of feels a little bit Devil May Cry-ish, 
like action that yeah. kind of action game very sort of much thing. the same sort of game awesome and yeah uh also what's not to love a switch who uh, switch a witch a switch a witch as uh, a witch that wraps herself in in her own hair what's not to love about that right yeah and also bear in mind the the the, the script of bayonetta i have always that's always my favorite aspect i imagine it's very ludicrous it is absolutely absurd and i love it <laughs> I would love to give the game a go sometime, but yeah, let's uh, let's hope that uh, Bayonetta fans are gonna gonna get what they what they want and what they deserve, I guess, because there's a lot of love for that game series. It's it, well, the thing is, it needs it. It really should happen. There's plot there's plot threads that weren't tied up by the second game, so I. Well, let's see. Let's hope uh, Kamiya isn't trolling us. And yeah, moving on, and this is not a troll. Mid, like right here in the beginning, really close to the beginning of the new Hearthstone season and new expansion release, and we're already seeing nerfs in Hearthstone? And no, Blizzard is not trolling us. They're actually nerfing. They've really nerfed a few cards, especially for Druid, for the Druid class, who has, which has been a highly controversial class this uh, this expansion. So they're not just, but they're not just nerfing one card for each, for, for the class like they usually do. They're nerfing... Two, they're nerfing two two cards for Druid, and they're nerfing a card for Warrior and a card for uh, for Shaman, and they're also nerfing a Murloc card. So I can see your look of confusion right now. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea. Let you're you're talking words, and I know what the words mean <laughs> separately. Yeah, but like contextually, I have no clue what you're talking about. Right. I don't want to touch too much on Hearthstone. I'm just going to talk about like the main stuff over here. So what happens is like Drew. What happens when the expansion comes out in Hearthstone? It's very often the case that there's the one class that has a that has like that that dominates. It's very easy for that to happen in Hearthstone and very common. Now, Druid, the big the big problem here is that there is a basic set of cards that you get for free when you access the game. And the problem that the community has with Blizzard is that uh is that the problem that the community has with Blizzard is that they're treating this this uh, set of cards, these basic cards as an evergreen set, meaning that they don't really change it as much. And that they maintain it the way it is. They do nerf a few of the cards if they find they're problematic. But they maintain the set as is. They don't remove other some cards from it and add some others. Because they feel that for, for very casual customers, it might be somewhat confusing for this to happen. Anyway, that's their excuse. So what the problem is that with Druid, Druid has this one card, which is zero mana. You get up to ten mana in this game. It costs zero mana to give you two extra mana for that one turn, which means that you can make some very absurd early plays, some very powerful ones. And this is part of uh, Druid's ability to ramp, as we call it, where basically it means that you can play cards earlier than your, than your opponent because of the mana ramping that you can do faster. So finally, this card called Innervate has been nerfed from do giving you two mana to giving you one. And that is uh, essentially a change that people wanted. Some people had suggested maybe having another change, but this is what Blizzard wanted to do because they wanted to maintain the identity of the card. The most crucial change that they're making, though, is another basic card, which is for Warrior, which is um, a weapon, which is two mana, and it's been like a, a weapon that has been used... For a very, very long time. And it's been in almost every warrior deck. And they're finally raising it to three mana. Now, if you're a, if you're a Hearthstone player, you probably understand what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about Fiery War Axe. If you're not, that's okay. We're going to move on now <laughs> from all of that. Unless you have any comments to make. Well, it, just, it just all sounds very interesting to me. I'm going to have to have a look at Hearthstone, I think. It is. I would say... Hearthstone's an interesting card game if you want to get into card games. But I find it too simple. I find it's not, it's not like it's I'm like a master or anything, but I find that the simplicity of it kind of makes the design space extremely narrow, which could make it for some very interesting design choices for expansions. But at the same time, sometimes I feel, why don't we have more options to deal with things on our own turn, on our mm -hmm. opponent's turn? 
Like some stuff like that that Magic had. That's why these days I'm playing another free card game called Eternal. Which is a lot more like Magic the Gathering. But it feels like it's basically taking Magic the Gathering and Hearthstone and fusing them together. So if you want to check out a card game and you've played uh, Magic the Gathering and you feel Hearthstone is uh, kind of too simple for your taste these days, give Eternal a go. It's on Steam. It's on mobile. It's great. I I'm enjoying it a lot. Might do a video or two about it as well. Okay. All right. Give that a shot. Yeah, why not? So moving on, Bethesda apparently has a unreleased, unannounced, unmentioned as much game slated for 2017 amidst the jam-packed jam schedule they already have. Well, I have several questions regarding this. Firstly, why the hell didn't they announce that during E3? Now, that, that's a very good question. Well, I think they did mention there is one more thing in the chamber, but they didn't say what it was at all, which is strange because, for E3 regardless. Hmm, it just seems weird that they wouldn't announce it at E3. And secondly, I can't help but feel, is this a unannounced game as in full game, or is it a port, or, or what? Because... If it was an unreleased game, I, I know where my mind would go immediately, and I would love it to be. It would be Doom 2. Hmm. Doom 2. Another Doom would be nice. Yeah, I, that that would definitely be not nice to be in the wish list. What else? What else would I would... What would I want it to be? Uh... Well, we, we know for sure it's not Elder Scrolls 6. Or 5. What are we on now? 6, yeah? It's definitely not that. Because of things that they've said in the past. But what else could it be? A re-release of an old Elder Scrolls? Maybe maybe a, a new expansion to Elder Scrolls Online. Hmm. Now, I think that would have been something they would have said already. I think. Possibly. It's an unannounced title. I'm not really sure what else I would put on a wish list up there. Doom 2 seems like it tops it all up right there. Mm. Yeah. Just do, a, a, sec a sequel to Doom would be great. Um... Because we already know we're getting a sequel to the worst game ever made, so and that comes out next month, doesn't it? Um, the worst game ever made. The Evil Within. Ah, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, that is my person. That that is my personal worst game ever made. The Evil Within. Um, and that's beating a lot of games to that title. Um. But yeah, I can't really think of anything else that Bethesda own that they'd be able to have such a turnaround on. I have no idea either. Maybe it's something completely new, which that would be nice as well, a new IP. Maybe, I, oh, actually, I've just thought of another one that would be quite popular. Porting Fallout 3 to modern consoles. Ooh, that wouldn't be bad. Because a lot of people loved Fallout 3 and New Vegas, so if they ported them both as a pack, as a bundle, onto PS4 and Xbox One, and Switch. Maybe with 4K support as well. And Switch. Oh, Switch would be amazing. I'd love a Fallout and game on Switch. I, I'd buy that well, in I'd a heartbeat. Never, ever complete it. I'd buy that in a heartbeat along with Skyrim. Skyrim comes out soon. That's yeah. November, isn't it? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And I'm picking it up because I haven't played Skyrim. Although, I had in the, initially I'd said I would play the VR experience, but I'm not going to... I don't have money right now to buy a, a, a PlayStation VR just to play Skyrim. So, yeah, that's going to have to wait. Hmm. I, I, I have no interest in VR, so <laughs> I've made my thoughts on VR very well known on this podcast, I think, actually. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, this is not really short It's and sweet. It's more like short and bitter. Near Automata getting lack of patches on PC. Actually, lack. There hasn't been a patch in a while for that poor game on PC. I mean, doesn't need it. I think there were some performance issues that needed to be addressed, but... Uh, I'm not. I'm not entirely sure because I, I. If I were to play that game, I would play it on PS4. But I think there are some performance issues that needed to be addressed, and they haven't already. So some people are speculating from the fact that there are no patches and nothing that has been mentioned on the patch that they said they were working on that maybe it's been abandoned. I hope not, because Neo Automata was one of the breakthrough hits of this year. I'd hate for it to fall by the wayside so quickly. It's an incredible game. I mean, I haven't played the full game. I played the demo. I thought it was incredibly 
well made. I love the I, the whole idea that it was like kind of like it was a multitude of different game types in one, like an action, a 3D action game, then a platformer, then a bullet hell. It was like so many kinds of games in one. It felt pretty cool. I do love bullet hells, actually. I would, I, 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 there needs to be more modern bullet hells. Why don't they make more bullet hells, man? But I guess indie developers are working on it. There are some bullet hells coming out on Switch, right? Yeah, actually, I think there is. There is. I can't remember what they're called, though. I, I, I forget as well. I mean, they always have these very weird names. Like, who, like, I don't know if I would have remembered, like, if you had told me about a game called R Type coming out now. I wouldn't have remembered it. I mean, it was more memorable back in the day, but now these all of these titles just seem very weird to me. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree entirely. It's because they're made by indies, and indie developers tend to err towards the weirder titles. Which is fine by me. I like that. Love mm -hmm. it a lot. Right, without further ado, we're moving into our big and positive section here, where basically I think I might be dominating the conversation. Uh, you might as well. You're, you're definitely the one for Destiny. Right, because yes, we're going to talk about Destiny 2. Destiny 2 released this past Wednesday, which happened to be my birthday as well. And I have to say, so far, amazing. Amazing experience. So much, so much better than Destiny 1. And I need to explain this a little bit quickly for people who have never played Destiny. Is that Destiny 1 came out and was nothing like what Bungie uh, had promised or had talked about in, during shows like E3 and wherever else they showed it off. They talked about this expansive world where you can dive in and out of your friend's game and, you know, do a lot of cooperative play. And for the most part, that was true. But the thing is that they didn't capitalize on this whole world building that they talked about. There wasn't much story. The game came with a lot of technical issues. It came with a lot of with a lack of content. It was supposed to feel like an MMORPG, but it didn't in the end. There was a lot of we there was a lot of controversy with both the first two expansions that came out. They didn't they weren't entirely expansions. They felt more like, you know, very overpriced added little content. But yeah, the game, despite all of this, managed to attract a lot of people and create a really, really big community of players, which is probably one of the best gaming communities I've ever seen. People there are extremely positive. If you go on our Destiny the game. People are very positive and helpful there. You go, you you play, even on PlayStation, you, you play with random people from different websites that you find them to make fire teams. They're really nice people. So overall, yeah, Destiny has managed, despite all the odds, against all the odds, to create and nurture a very nice gaming environment. And now this time around, they're really, truly bringing out the Bingods with Destiny 2. So what is the first thing I would like to say about Destiny 2 is that it has, an, it, first of all, story. Like, right right off the bat, here's story. You wanted story? Here. Have as much as you want. You get to know the characters better. You get to experience the story and the, 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 the world the way it was supposed to be experienced. Uh, you really understand why you're doing what you're doing in the game now compared to Destiny 1. Uh, there's now, now you've got maps. Now you've got whole environments to explore. Uh, lots of content, lots of activities to follow. You get your standard quests, but you also got your little adventures here and there. You get to do a little bit of exploring, and you always, you're always finding something new on, uh, around every corner. Like, I was playing with my friends the other day, and I was turning a corner, and like, oh, there's a chest. And then we go down a little bit, oh, there's another chest. So let's open a chest here, a chest there. Go explore this cave, go into that place, do this public event, do that adventure. It was... So there's just so many things. It's crazy. It feels a lot more like an MMO now. So yeah, uh, overall, yes, Destiny Two, great, great. I'm I'm having a lot of fun. If you're a person who has been on the fence about buying it because you didn't like Destiny One or you heard that Destiny One was a fail, which yeah was a debatable t topic, I think Destiny Two deserves another look into. And also, I think it's the most active I've seen you on PSN since I added you on PSN. I literally, because I've not seen you really on there. And now, and now almost every time I sign on, I just see your little icon, Destiny 2. Um, and it's good. It's good to see you on PlayStation. Yeah, yep. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be on my console a bit more now. 
even though I also do have to finish Dark Souls. But yeah, I'm uh, I've definitely been playing more on that, and I'm really happy for that. It's it's actually rekindled a lot of my uh, my my love for like playing this particular game because I played Destiny one for three years, and I have two very good friends that we play with together, and actually one of them I met through the game. He's uh, he's the guy who made my Dark Souls uh, my my Dark Souls uh, thumbnail, Charlie, and he lives in Thailand. I've never seen the guy, never. But he's right now he's one of my one of my best friends, and he's uh, we play Destiny together. It's really incredible. It has like that. It's good when you get communities like that. It really is. I don't know what it is, but it's something about this particular game that gets people really excited about it, even with all of its uh, shortcomings. It's the gunplay is really good. Like from ever since Destiny One, you feel that that the shooting, the gunplay is very snappy, very responsive. the 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 pacing feels just about right. It's all like even this whole feel that you're pressing two buttons and you're activating your super feels very powerful. Feels very, very strong. I mean, if there was ever a game that made you feel in, in some ways a superhero, this is the one. Speaking of which. Could you explain to me what this whole what this whole shader controversy is? Because ah. I don't because I know what the word shader means, <laughs> but I have no idea what it means in the context of this game, and it's causing a lot of controversy, and I don't quite understand it. Right, I will get to that right now because yes, it can't be a video game without some controversy, right? But uh, yeah, so here's the deal: a shader in Destiny is basically a little item you use to color your gear. No. Oh, so, oh, so it's like a essentially a paint job on your armor. It's a tint. It's a yeah. Okay. It's a paint job. Yeah. yeah. What it, call it? What you will. It's uh, and the way it worked in Destiny One was you had this little item and you would use it. You would put it on your gear and it would just give your entire like your entire outfit. It would give it a color scheme. Now what they decided to do was we're not going to make make it you know apply to the whole uh, to the entirety of your armor. You can use it on individual pieces. Which is great. It's something that we wanted. And you can even do it on weapons now. You can do it on your on your spaceship. You can do it on your uh, on your Sparrow, which is a little hover bike that we have, which is amazing. It's kind of like you're in Star Wars when you ride it. Um, but here's the problem. That first of all, Destiny 2 is a game that has microtransactions, which is fine. Okay, which is fine in and of itself. Okay, but... Now, they've made uh, shaders one-time use. In the past, you would get a shader and you had it. And you, it didn't matter how many times you swapped in and out your colors, you had it permanently. But now, they're one-time use. So you apply it onto your helmet, it's gone. So, does that mean that additional shaders are now microtransactions? You can, but... I'm going to be a little bit... I need to, like, you know, give balance to the discussion here. Of course, yeah. First of all, yes. Part of the microtransactions is that you can get these, uh, what they call bright emblem, bright engrams, because that's what they call the, the boxes that you receive for loot. They call them engrams. So these bright engrams, you can buy them from a, from, with real money from, the, uh, from, a, from a person on the, on the tower, which is the social space of the game. Uh... And these bright engrams, they look, they work like loot boxes. They're random, and they could have weapons. They could have shaders, ships, sparrows, anything. They could have anything in them. And yeah, that's what's caused people some outrage right now because that the fact that you, they, it seems like they did it this way. They made them one time used to encourage you to keep buying bright engrams. But um, yeah, I have one more question. <laughs> I, I promise I won't keep interrupting you. Um, the shaders, do they now have attributed to particular items, or can you say use a shader on any item? I am not so like if you, so if you got say two shaders, mm -hmm. um, are they both just listed as shader, and then you can select your I don't know helmet and your your shoes, um, or do you get helmet shaders? and armor shaders and weapon shaders. So are there specific shaders for each item you can color or do you, does any shader work on any item? I on that I'm going to uh, I'm going to say that for armor, like if it's a if it's a shader, for what I know for sure is that if an armor if a shader can be applied to your helmet, it can be applied to any other item because they okay, give them, that's better. they give them to you in packs of 5 and you have 5 pieces of armor. So 
yeah, I think it works like that. I'm not clear, though, if the same shader can be used on a ship. If you want to color coordinate with your spaceship and your weapons and all that, that I'm not clear. But for the time being, I'm going to say yes-ish, maybe. Maybe that's the case. Uh, okay, that's better, because I thought, uh, when I heard about all of this, I um, I assumed that they they were one use, and by one use, that meant that they were not only consumable, but they only had one use. It's much better that a shader can be used on multiple items. Not, not You can only use it once, but you can use it on a variety, shall we share, of items, rather than it being, because I, I assumed when you were talking about it that it was a specific thing. Right. So you'd get a shader for your helmet, but if you bought a loot box and you only got, say, one shader for your helmet, it's just like, well, that's I I need I want to do my my legs. Um, that's what I thought it would be. So it's better. I mean, I still I I still don't personally agree with microtransactions anyway. But it's better this way. I uh, I would say that yeah, it is better and it does feel a lot better. And I, in order to bring balance to the conversation, the game doesn't expect you to get these things through microtransactions. This the my, so far to me it feels like the microtransactions are there if you want to speed up the process of acquiring yeah. stuff. Which okay, for some people this feels unfair, but you know what? That's the industry we're living in right now. And that's how we kind of have to face things a little bit. And to be completely fair, uh Destiny is an MMO without the subscription. You just buy the game one time and that's it. You don't pay a f you don't pay a subscription fee beyond your PSN, Xbox Live. But the thing is that the consumable one time has a bit of a problem, and that is even though they're showering you with stuff. Like to be honest, I played a couple of times today. I logged in two times and did like some short activities here and there. I was showered with stuff. I was showered with 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 the uh, shaders, with weapons, with mods, with. I don't even know what to do with all this shit because I don't have the time to analyze it all these days. And to be up, to, like, to be honest, I mean, there's a lot of stuff. But here's the problem. In the past, I'm one of those guys who always changes his shader. But I like to go back to other color schemes that I used to play with. I can't hmm. do that with this system now because that means I have to, I have to start, like, you know, hoarding specific shaders in a corner somewhere. If I get a new piece of armor... I need to put I need to color coordinate it again. What if I don't have that mm. shader anymore? It just ruins my fashion style, right? And that is the big problem here is that you can't you can't continuously change your appearance like that. Even mm. though they shower you with it, it's still a little bit problematic and it makes you wonder why are you doing it like this? I know you want to get me to pay more money. I understand that. But it's so anti-consumer here. It's so yeah. against, and there's this other problem. It was like this in Destiny 1. Why did you completely change it for Destiny 2? You took one step forward and then two steps backwards, quite literally on this topic. And yeah, but hopefully, I'm going to, I'm going to be, I'm going to throw a lot of uh, benefit of the doubt to Bungie here is that they do listen. And that's how we've gotten to this point to have Destiny 2 the way it is today, because they do listen. Destiny 2 is a testament to them listening to what the community has to say. Even though there are a few more shortcomings, like silly little things like you can, I can track, I can be in a fire team, for example, and I can set a, an activity and track its location. But the rest of my fire team doesn't see that. Even though I'm the leader of the group, they still don't see what I'm tracking. And that's kind of silly. Why didn't you make it mm. so that all the whole team can track? But no, we have to be like, oh, we're going that way. Oh, why did Clinton go the other side? You know, these things happen, right? So these are silly little things like that that they need to like kind of address. But overall, the game has a lot of good quality of life improvements to it. It's giving us a shit ton of content to work with. The PvP has improved a lot. And I have to say that the new modes that they're introducing are really exciting. Competi the competitive mode is pretty exciting so far as well. I like what they've done with the with with the weapons and they've changed the weapon slots the way they work. Some people have a different opinion on it. But overall, I feel that the game is in a massive improvement over the first one and definitely give it a shot. Hopefully this controversy with shaders gets uh, ironed out eventually, which I sure it, I'm sure it will. And yeah, that's that's me on Destiny 2. <laughs> and that's a massive and to be fair, only slight negativity, mostly positive, which is 
which you can't really say for a lot of games nowadays, can you? No, you can't. You Usually really they can't. come with about a 50-50, like level of negative and positive. But on this one, you've got quite literally overwhelming positive, a couple of negative aspects. Um, so well done, Bungie, evidently, for that. Yep. I'm going to be a little bit fair to some people. I haven't really gone into, like, the harder difficulty stuff. I haven't done a Nightfall Strike yet. I have it, which is like a heroic mode dungeon kind of thing. The raid hasn't come out yet, so that's going to happen next week. And I haven't tried that yet, so I'm not sure what that's going to be like. But overall, yes. I mean, if, you, if you're particularly new and have been iffy about buying the game, that's my opinion for you. Give it a go. And I'm definitely going to do a bit of a more analytical video with some of my impressions of the game, but I want to wait until, you know, more of the content is out and experience it before I actually give a final impression on it. Yeah, because otherwise you don't know. Exactly. They could end up ironing out the things that you would end up pointing out as a negative, at which point you'd invalidate your own video. <laughs> that is true. That is indeed definitely true. Right, so... That's that's your gaming news for the week there. I think everything is uh, looking pretty bright and nice for the gaming community. And, and we've got a couple of months of very interesting things coming up as well. Yeah. Um, because we've got the Tokyo Game Show. We've got Eurogamer Expo. Um, this month, we've got Metroid 2 Return of Samus. And then next month, we've got... Um, uh, well, we've got Super Mario Odyssey, Fire Emblem Warriors. Um, I'm sure I've missed... Oh, either within two i guess yeah um but yeah like th this year has been a phenomenal year already and we've got another few months worth of incredible games still to come so it's 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 coming along isn't it it's really coming along yeah it's really exciting stuff this year that seems to keep just dropping up new cool stuff for us all the time really exciting stuff so what would you like to share with us this week uh, right. Um, okay. So, uh, my, I'm finally catching up on YouTube videos. It's taken a time. Um, but there should be one up this evening and there'll be another one up tomorrow. Um, just trying to catch up on the highlight reels mostly. Uh, I'll be streaming again Tuesday, normal. Um, and also I will be uh, starting to transfer over some older stuff onto the site, rudethegamer.com. So uh, some of my older articles, my older reviews, uh, and uh, still trying to still trying to transfer all my YouTube videos over because there's quite a few. <laughs> um, other than that, yeah, just just the normal stuff, the streams and daily articles, daily daily things going up on the site. So always check back. There's some nighttime reading for me, bedtime reading. Yeah, I'll be very looking forward to reading that stuff. How much time you got? Uh, I, I fall asleep pretty easily when I'm reading, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> doesn't not a dig towards you, by the way. Not saying that your stuff is boring. Uh, yeah, uh, for me, new Dark Souls just got came up this morning, and uh, not this morning, like a few a couple of hours ago. Uh, so yeah, episode twenty two after the highly uh you know questionable episode twenty one quote unquote that I released earlier this week, which was uh. Partly due to my uh, inability to actually click the record button. Have I clicked record on this one? Yes, I did. <laughs> I'm I double forgot, checking I forgot myself. to actually say, I forgot to say, episode 21 was genuinely hilarious because I did not expect that music. <laughs> I did not expect it at all. So when it happened, I was just like, this could not be a better chosen music for what has happened here. <laughs> I'm glad it's somebody's very, very saying good. something positive about it. Well, to be fair, I mean, it, was, it, it wasn't it was like the greatest thing I've ever done in my life. But yeah, I felt like, eh, I don't want to lose this footage. I want to do something with mm. it. So yeah, why not? And Benny Hill felt like something that would fit the situation pretty well. Oh, it definitely did. Yeah. Definitely. Also, look forward to some uh, Destiny content starting from next week. Hopefully, I got... I had some issues with my whole party chat and making videos, so every all the footage I made in the uh, on the first day was completely trash uh, because you could just hear me double doubling up on the video and I couldn't fix that at all. But you can see a lot of the stuff in the video today. That's part of our featured footage here on the video. So yeah, on the weekly gaming glass. So yeah, uh, and yeah, before we close, I'd like to give a huge shout out to our friend uh, Charlotte Steer. 
Um, I saw yesterday, and she said uh, she looks forward to the weekly gaming blast every week. We've got our first fan. A fan. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Charlie. We really appreciate uh, your comments, and hopefully we'll continue to meet your expectations. Yep, and um, hopefully we'll just keep getting better and better for you as well. Yep, so yeah, and if you've got any comments to make, whether positive or negative, you can leave some in the comment section below. Or you... Or Twitters. Or Twitters, right over here, right underneath us, Akibana Zero, Rue the Gamer, right over there. If you want to catch uh, Rue the Gamer stuff, it's always at RueTheGamer.com and all of his other links in the description below, plus my own. And that's going to do it for this week. Uh, that's your weekly gaming blast. I uh, hope you enjoyed enjoyed listening to us. If you did, leave a like and subscribe. And we will catch you next time. See you soon.